Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's virtual bison program mini session. We want to thank you all for joining us and we are especially grateful for your interest in the Crane Trust. We are your hosts, Kylie Warren and Josh Weesey. At this time, I invite you all to introduce yourselves in the comments. Please tell us where you are watching from. And please tell us if you're familiar with the Crane Trust. I want to give a special shout out to our Crane Trust members. Without people like you supporting the Crane Trust, the work we do here and the views you are seeing now would not be possible. So welcome all again to tonight's program and we will be starting shortly. We look forward to hearing from you. keep going. Tonight's mini session is a sneak peek at one of the many virtual programs we offer throughout the year. Virtual programs began with what you're looking at right now, our live river cameras we have about our habitat. They also evolved from the virtual crane tours first offered at the Crane Trust during the pandemic. Uh, we have crane season in March, many of you may know. And during the pandemic, we wanted to offer a virtual crane tour to our members so they could still enjoy the migration even remotely. Our flagship program is what Crane Trust is known for, the crane tour. And you can enjoy this in March as a Crane Trust member, usually 24-7 uh, through our live camera footage. And then in the evening at dawn and dusk, when the river is most active, we do offer guided tours. We also offer virtual programs on many wonder, wondrous things found here at Crane Trust Habitat to include prairie chickens, whooping cranes, the field work accomplished by our fellowship programs, and of course, what we're about to watch tonight, the great American bison. Uh, I first wanna talk a little bit about the techniques to reiterate the safety protocol we mind while working with bison. As mentioned, we do have a variety of virtual cameras on the property that we're able to live stream to you. And the footage I'm about to switch to of our bison is footage that we went out into the field to capture. And unlike our cranes, bison are less predictable when it comes to our virtual cameras. So we have to actually go out in the field and capture this footage in a more traditional format. The primary shots we are bringing you tonight were mostly captured over the course of this year. Uh, we have done so safely in vehicles for the most part, and we have a lot of footage to show you to include our bison pastures, baby bison, bison wallowing and grazing, bison at dusk, and then a curated glimpse of our crane trust habitat. So without further ado, please enjoy our bison. Our bison pasture is huge and requires, as it requires a lot of space for bison to roam. And the bison uh, uh, re sit on, what is it about Josh, 1,200 12, 12, 12. acres uh, of property at any given time. Much of this footage was recorded across uh, June and July uh, while the boss bison were in the process of raising their baby calves. So I'm not a bison expert, Josh is, and that is uh, why we have him here tonight. So I'm going to introduce you to our range manager, Josh Weesey. He has generously given his time tonight to be with us, and he is here to discuss his work along with this expertise on our bison and our prairie habitat. So welcome, Josh. Thank you. 
Uh, would you be so kind, Josh, to tell us a little bit about what you do here at Crane Trust and uh, how you work with the bison? Um, well, I've been here for um, going on 10 years here soon, and a uh, big part of my job is to uh, make sure that the health in, of the landscape and the habitat is intact. Uh, we do a lot of land management activities to control invasive species and promote native biodiversity. And I'm out there um, in the grass and in the weeds and in the flowers to um, essentially assess um, whether our, our management practices are um, meeting and achieving our goals. One of those goals that we had here at the trust was to, to reintroduce bison and um, we brought them back and my, my big part of my job is to uh, make sure that they're staying healthy and, and um, taking data and re taking lots of uh, data recordings um, and making sure that uh, we keep our bison in check and we, we watch and study um, how the reintroduction on the landscape after 150 years is evolving the landscape and, and revitalizing and rejuvenating it. Thank you so much, Josh. Uh, yeah, so the work that the bison, that Josh does with the bison is very important and uh, he is very knowledgeable. So thanks again, Josh, for being here. And I want to thank you all again for being here. If you are just joining us, please introduce yourselves in the comments and please know that if at any time throughout this program you have questions or thoughts, feel free to drop them in the comments and we will get to them, get them to, uh, get to answering those as quickly as we can. I want to uh, welcome those of you who have already done this. We have Carrie, is Carrie Weesey. And we have Pat Gamet. So thank you so much for being here with us tonight. We also have Kate and Jack. Thank you so much for joining us. So one thing you'll note about the footage is that it is roughly raw footage and it is trying to keep in tune with some of the styles we use at, during our virtual crane tours to the best that we can. But we did, again, capture it from a safe, at a safe distance from the bison using a largely long lens and cropping. This is our second grazing shot of the bison. And uh, Josh, I'd like to know, uh, what's the day in, a li in the life of a bison at Crane Trust like, especially this time of year? Um, well, a, a day in the life of a bison is pretty, pretty simple. Um, they're expert grazers, um, so they spend most of their days uh, grazing and, and moving about the landscape and um, putting that uh, disturbance pressure that these grasslands evolved with. Um, today, uh, right now, they, we're just getting started uh, with the rutting season, so uh, you'll start to see bulls tending their females, a lot of grunting going on, um, and uh, we get ready every, every time of the, uh, this time of year comes around for a lot of excitement, and uh, it's really sort of the best time to really see the buffalo. We get to see um, the calves being born just a few months ago and, and now moving into the rut. This is really where uh, things get lively. That's really exciting and yes it is fun to go out there and kind of see all the behaviors and the bulls intermixing with with the herd. 
Um, why do the bulls spend a lot of time alone when they are not running? So it's, um, it's a risk for the bulls to be uh, with the females and sort of uh, tending those females outside of the rut. So their, um, their hormones during the rutting season uh, inspires them to come join the females and, and um, start that breeding process. But the rest of the year, they're totally happy um, being um, kind of away from the main herd and away from the females and calves. Um, and loafing and you see the rest of the year that these bison these male bison uh, tend to uh, play really nice with each other um, outside of the rutting season so again it's it's that high risk of being in with those females and potentially um, exhibiting that they're a threat to another bull. Well that's really fascinating um, and so how many species and subspecies of bison are there and, and what kind do we have at Crane Trust? Um, so in the world, there are two species of bison. Um, we have the American bison and then the European bison, also known as the wizent. Um, both are, have been, um, in their past, uh, critically overhunted. Um, and in, the, uh, in North America, we actually have two subspecies of the American bison. We have um, the woods bison, which can be found in Wood Buffalo National Park and up in Canada. And then we have the uh, plains bison, which is the bison we have here um, on, on the Crane Trust property and, and what most people would equate to when they think of a bison. I'm just looking at this footage right now. Uh, the bison are grazing on our grasslands here. Uh, what kind of grasses do they tend to eat? So bison really focus on um, fresh grasses. So young grasses, short grasses, grasses that are just um, freshly regrowing. Um, so they, they're not super discriminatory about which grasses they eat, but they, they are discriminatory about the, the age of those grasses. And what you'll see is that bison um, graze off an area pretty short, and then they'll move out of that area and then come back to it in just a couple days. And what okay. that is, is essentially that that grass has had time to regrow, and that young, fresh grass has the highest nutrient content. There are a few grasses and, and things that the bison will um, not graze as readily, but they also seem to save grasses um, throughout the summertime and not graze certain areas so that they can have a place to forage um, later throughout the winter. Wow. And I remember a, a wonderful dialogue uh, between you and I think it was uh, Conservation Nebraska where you presented on bison and you talked about how bison were different from cows in terms of how they graze and how how they graze our native prairie here and would you mind talking a little bit about that because i thought that was really fascinating um, yeah so there's a couple things that we're starting to notice different between bison and cattle um, firstly is that um, it's well known that bison don't need or have the water requirements the drinking requirements that cattle do so they're able to travel further away from water resources um, and graze uh, a wider area because of that. The other that we're seeing is, is that usually when we have cattle in on a piece of grassland, they they tend to graze it really short, um, depending on how many you have stocked and those types of things. But bison are really leaving a patchiness on the landscape. And when we talk about habitat and what's good for the birds and good for the small mammals and all the other wildlife that exists here at the Crane Trust, um, it's, it's really important to talk about structure. And what I'm seeing is that bison, as they tend those areas that they keep returning to, they're creating short grass structure. Um, as they're avoiding different areas, they're creating tall grass structure and, and, and a mix between. And really that's, that's the perfect suite that we need for our wildlife. Um, and we also have done some diet studies to look at what bison are eating and, and they really have a really wide um, breadth of forage. So it's not just grasses, they're um, grazing on some forbs and different things like that, that um, probably have some nutritional value that, that they're able to get out of the prairie that, that cattle are not. Wow, thank you so much, Josh. Uh, and bison also work uh, beneficially to the other species that live and visit the area in particular I love a little drawing in your office actually it's a little bison plus a crane uh, what health uh, what what how does having bison uh, help the health of cranes and the habitat uh, for the cranes so um, if you were to look at where cranes have historically um, existed throughout North America 
um, both whooping cranes and sandhill cranes. Um, and if you were to take that map and overlay it on um, the bison distribution throughout North America historically, what you'd find is that bison inhabited nearly the entire range of where um, cranes migrated, wintered, um, and, and nested at. So um, what bison are doing is essentially creating some low, um, low areas to which cranes are e able to forage in our wet meadows and tall grass prairie. Um, they're, they're defoliating certain areas to which cranes can more easily get down to the soil um, and root out whether it be tubers or macroinvertebrates and things to get their protein. Um, and we talk uh, a bit about you know, where corn is important for a fatty substance for these cranes, uh, the proteins that which they get um, in our wet meadows and our tall grass prairie systems really is what equates to nesting success when they get up to their winter or to their summer yeah. grounds. Very cool. Yeah, I just think that that correlation. I'm, if you are all going to join us on Sunday, we do have some bison commingling with cranes that we managed to capture in March. So I'll be sharing that. Uh, on Sunday for our members exclusive. And I wanna thank you again, Josh. Uh, we're gonna take a quick break. And if you have any questions at all, please leave them in the comments. If you are just joining us, uh, please tell us where you're watching from. I want to thank all of you who have done so, so far. Uh, this is our virtual bison program mini session. And thanks again, we will be right back. Uh, so we're back. Josh, what pasture are we looking at right now? Now this is the pasture with the windmill in it. It's uh, from where we're sitting right now here in the studio. It's uh, southeast of here. So that would be what we call the office pasture. So that pasture essentially makes a big L around where our headquarters is at. Um, usually we like to have the bison around that area during crane season so our guests can get a chance to, to see them. Um, but yeah, that, that office pasture um, is a relic system. Um, quite a few years ago before the Crane Trust got ownership of it, it was planted in, in grass hay um, on top of the native grasses and forbs that were already there. So uh, we're really using the bison in this area to knock back some of those non-native grasses that were intentionally planted years and years ago. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a wetter area for us and for the bison. Um, but it's really interesting to see them out there grazing right out, the, right out your office window. That is pretty cool. Uh, we're about to look at bison wallowing, but I just want to mention that this is a pasture that the cranes and the bison were vibing in last crane season. So, so again, thanks, Josh, for that intel. Uh, we've got a question. So uh, Pat Gamut has asked on our 1,200 or so acres, what is our, our pasture load? Um, so we're trying to keep uh, somewhere between 115 and 125 uh, adult animals, leaving room uh, for their yearlings. So somewhere between 40 and 50 yearlings that we have every year. And then um, that also leaves room for 40 to 50 uh, calves to be born every year. So 
uh, right around one, 115 to 125 adult animals. And then um, again, that leaves plenty of forage for uh, their calves and yearlings, and that leaves uh, plenty of forage for them to be grazing out on the landscape 12 months out of the year. So they're out there grazing with no supplemental feed, even in the winter time. And then how often do you rotate? Uh, so rotation depends upon our management strategy. So they have two or four pastures in total to which they can um, rotate in and out of. Uh, sometimes we only have them in one. Sometimes we might have three pastures open, uh, just depending on our grazing goals uh, based upon what we want to see on the habitat. Thank you. And thank you, Angela Turner and David Robertson for joining us. We appreciate you both for being here. Um, from Fort Collins as well. And Texas. Uh, so if you have any more questions, please ask. What we're looking at now is a bison wallowing in the mid-afternoon, Josh. And oh, why do bison wallow? So uh, wallowing is a behavior not just unique to bison, but other large ungulates also um, will wallow. But uh, bison do it at a much higher degree than what you'll see cattle. So uh, if you were to look at our uh, property where our bison are at, on the Crane Trust landscape, you'll see several hundred wallows throughout the property. And so they're doing this for several reasons. Um, first and foremost, they do a dusting to help remove um, and keep insects off of them. So that rolling in the dust helps create a grit that the insects don't like. Um, the other is, is that they do it to help them shed. So as they come out of winter into the spring, um, they got a, a lot of, of shaggy fur around um, and they're trying to rub that off. Uh, the other reason they might wallow is to show aggression. So um, you might see a big bull uh, create a wallow and rub up in it and then another bull walks up and, and rubs himself into that wallow uh, sort of showing um, aggression and dominance um, as a, in a way yeah i thought it was interesting in, in the footage right before the shot we had a bison with quite a bit of what looked to be shedding hair, hair to still be shed uh, and i've learned that they can actually turn this into a wool yeah. and spin it like a, a cashmere or a, a merino and that people make scarves and, and things out of that. So that, that's kind of interesting. And so the wallowing, what you're saying, is help, helps them with that shedding process. Um, we will be hopefully seeing some footage uh, where I saw two bison scratching each other. Is that also part of that process? Do they do they help each other get the hair off, as it were? Or um, is that yeah, just a, you might see, especially with the, uh, the cows, the moms might be scratching off their their yearlings fur. Um, uh, they also might just want a, a post or something um, or something to scratch on. So they may okay. not actually be scratching each other. They may be using each other to scratch themselves. Objectifying each other. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, we always talk about wallowing in our sorrows. So uh, I don't know. Uh, it, it doesn't look like these bison are very unhappy about wallowing. They look like they're actually kind of having some fun do you think it's fun for them? Yeah, you know, and it also, that wallow, um, creating that, that deeper in, deeper indentation to the into the soil can help them cool off too. So they get, um, you know, the, the soil level mm -hmm. is, tends to be cooler than the air temperature. So being down in that bowl can help them uh, cool off. So yeah, they're definitely not doing it uh, out of, uh, you know, out of begrudgingly. They're definitely doing it because it's something they, they like to do. So. It is pretty special. Um, I will admit that this is actually footage from last year. I've not seen as much wallowing this year, and maybe it is because it's been cooler. Uh, that might be. Uh, the, the bugs haven't seemed to be, especially the flies, haven't mm -hmm. seemed to be quite as bad this year, so that might have something to do with it. Um, and they also, that uh, that they still, they, they have lost quite a bit of their fur already this year, mm -hmm. so they might not be doing that as much either, yeah. but... Uh, with temperatures getting close to 100 in Nebraska next week, uh, you can expect to see them yeah. laying down in some wallows. I'll be wallowing in sorrow when that happens. All right, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Josh. Uh, we are going to take another quick break, and I'm going to just uh, type out some answers to some of your questions on the screen uh, as we watch more of this wallowing footage. And if you have any questions, comments, or thoughts, please drop them in the comments. Thanks again, Josh, and we will be right back.
All right, we're back. We're going to answer some of these questions. I've got Josh uh, looking at the questions here right now. Josh, which question are you going to tackle first? Uh, I'm going to take Jack's on. Uh, do bison sleep uh, standing up or laying down or both? Um, so bison will rest standing up, but when but they like to sleep uh, laying down. So uh, I always think of bison sort of sleeping with one eye open, so um, ready to get up and go at a moment's notice. It's interesting, uh, cranes sleep with one eye open. <laughs> uh, I don't think bison literally do, but uh, like I said, bison are sort of ready to get up and, and move away from a predator or a threat at, at any given time. So, But they do sleep laying down. Thank you. And we have a question. I'll let you, I'll let you uh, take roll on this. Which one would you like to answer uh, next? Um, so we have Dad Gamut um, asks if any pastures, do we have any pastures that uh, the bison are able to cross the plat? Um, and do they have any uh, utilization of water in, in the area? So we actually don't have any places where bison can cross the Platte. And for those of you that may or may not know, the Platte's a very, very wide river. Um, and we actually have people that, that kayak down the Platte River and, and um, tube down the Platte River. So it's really hard to put some sort of permanent structure across um, something that may be up to a half mile wide. Um, and then to keep that from impeding um, people that are trying to use the river. Uh, that being said, uh, we do have several waterways that run through, um, through our, our bison pastures. We have two um, warm water sloughs, so that are groundwater fed, that run through and, and hold water throughout the year. And then we actually have a little pond that they can use. Um, bison, you'll see them um, in the warm seasons. Uh, standing in that water from time to time uh, cooling off so that's kind of how they use that water we'd love to see the bison be able to cross the plat one day but right now it's just a, uh, a logistical um, impossibility so. wow and then there's the roads and other I was reading uh, Black Elk Speaks and there was a line in there about how uh, building the railroad and the roads have cut the herds in half so i imagine even today those are also concerns for bison crossing you know waterways and and other kinds of uh, pathway structures uh, that's interesting so okay we had more questions um, we see. had a question from angela here asking about what what birds um how are we seeing in this footage uh flying around the bison so we do see quite a few birds use um the bison areas we see metal arcs um, quite a bit around the bison uh cattle egrets but i'm guessing the ones that um that angela was referring to were uh, brown-headed cowbirds uh, which probably were more aptly named or would have been more aptly named brown-headed bison birds um, so they follow the bison, um, picking off pests and insects off of uh, the bison fur, and they also uh, are attracted to those patties that bison make, um, those uh, fecal patties, the to chocolate. which they can, yeah, to, <laughs> to which they can uh, uh, feed on the insects that quickly find uh, those patties to start laying eggs. Things like dung beetles and flies very quickly uh, find those patties to start breaking them down. So a great food resource for. Um, a smart bird that likes to follow them. And I heard a rumor that cranes like to turn those patties upside down they, too. They do. Um, cranes, metal larks, and other birds like egrets like to flip over patties to find um, goodies that may be hiding underneath of them. Footage went dark. We're, that means the end of the clip. So we're going to move on. This footage was captured yesterday at our pond. Despite being a somewhat brisk and I think sprinkly morning, they were. Uh, loving the water still so the bison love the water and, and do you know much about bison and their relationship with water well they need water first of all um, yeah. just like anything they they need water to drink um, and you know there, there may also be certain benefits to grazing um, different areas around water um, so different plants offer different nutrients and things to um, to these bison so uh, they may be uh, preferring to graze something around the water at different times of the year to gain, uh, to meet their nutrient needs. And so I'm just noticing the shagginess on some of these bisons. That's, that's that winter coat coming off. Uh, and in addition to grazing, they're mostly loafing in this footage. So bison are just kind of hanging out. Mm -hmm. um, let's see if we have any questions before I ask my next one, which is always about loafing. Let's see. 
High river flows. Since we are on the topic of water, let's look at Carrie's question. Any observations on wetland behavior on Crane Trust lands in response to high river flows this summer? So that's that's a little not bison related, but I think the bison are loving the high water. What do you think, Josh? Um, so the, the they've not re we're not really seeing much response as far as the high river goes, but it does have an effect to the water table. So. Um, high river flows in, in the plat generally means that the water table is high and generally means that a lot more plants are able to reach that, um, that uh, saturated zone and be able to draw up water. So it generally means that we're really productive on wetter years um, here in the plat. Um, but we have had uh, different times throughout the last several years where you've had some extreme flooding, some flash flooding events and things like that. And bison are very... Uh, keen into knowing where to go and how to get away from those areas um, that are, are wet or inundated. So bison will generally tend to find the high ground and here at the Crane Trust we have a lot of um, undulation of the land so a lot of up and down um, even though it looks flat from a distance. So bison uh, really go and try to seek out those high areas uh, during uh, flash flood events. Thank you Josh. Um there's another bison standing. He's got that shaggy coat. That's just so fascinating to me that, that, that it's so obvious that it's just there. Um, so I had another question about uh, why, why do boy, bison um, enjoy water? Do they use the same watering hole if they, if they like one? I mean, how many watery, watering hole opportunities are there here at Crane Trust? And, and uh, do they have a favorite one? I know they love this one by the road. So, so they have access to three, um, like I said, two uh, warm water sloughs and then one uh, pasture pond. Um, and depending on where they're at, they have access to one or none of those waterways. Um, so uh, this one in particular uh, being a, a kind of a constant um, and continuous site for water, they definitely seek that out. Um, and they, they feel safe at that area. Um, and you notice all the wallows that are around there. So that, that's obviously just a nice loafing area for them, a place to stay cool in the summertime. And there's a lot of wallows there. Um, David Huckabee, thank you for joining us from Florida, land of the Florida Sandhill Crane. Uh, uh, Linda, thank you for joining us. And Linda has a question. How do we move a bison from one pasture to another? Um, so bison are pretty smart and they know where these gates are that, that will lead into another pasture. So we never like to force our bison anywhere. Um, we practice low stress handling. We'll talk about a little bit about that later today. Um, but uh, essentially we leave a gate open till, um, you know, one of the smart females, the older, uh, more dominant females finds that gate and starts to lead the rest of the herd. Uh, through there. Occasionally we'll have one or two that want to stay back for a few days, but um, it's pretty easy when they see that big tall grass and more forage. Um, I mean, sometimes it's just a matter of waiting a few days for them to find it, uh, which really doesn't uh, impede our management um, goals. Um, so we just kind of allow bison to um, naturally find that, that opening and, and get a chance to go through. So, Cool. Thank you. And then Jack has asked about veterinary requirements. All right, well, and I, I actually had a health question too. This is kind of interrelated. So thank you, Jack, for asking that. Um, what veterinary requirements do bison have and what kind, of, what kind of health issues do they, are they vulnerable to? Um, so uh, much of the same uh, health issues that, you know, cattlemen deal with with their cows here in this area. Pink eye and hoof rot tend to be the two most um, reoccurring uh, types of uh, bison diseases that we see. And again, that's, that's not uncommon through the cattle industry here in central Nebraska. Um, there are several that are on our radar as potential um, uh, illnesses or diseases of bison. Uh, we've not seen any of those um, come up. Uh, but uh, our veterinary requirements are actually really low. Uh, we used to have a parasite treatment program. Uh, we canceled that based upon our results, sort of finding that bison are naturally, um, become naturally immune to shedding uh, parasites as they grow older. So beyond that two years of age, they really, they tend to have on average a really low parasite count. 
Uh, there's also several uh, diseases like clostridial diseases that we um, actually do not treat for and no, no longer vaccinate for uh, here. And, and something important to note is that there's never been a vaccine um, or a parasite treatment that's been designed for bison. They've all been designed for the cattle industry with assumptions that bison will react the same way. So here we really take a natural selection approach, um, allowing some the natural pressures of things like disease to, um, to, uh, to influence the bison. We feel like um, having natural selection act upon the bison is going to uh, wind up providing a more resilient bison in the future. Uh, you know, one thing to note is that, we, you know, we even have on occasion in injuries that happen um, here at the Crane Trust, whether usually from fighting or uh, things of that nature between two bulls. And what you might find is that even though something looks bad, these bison are so resilient that they t tend to pull out, pull out of that injury. Um, and we see that all the time. We see a, a you know, a bison that may have a, a flesh wound, and we give it a couple weeks, and it's it's ready to breed and, and go about its normal behavior um, after that. So. Uh, we really, really practice what we call biosecurity here, and essentially that's keeping our bison away from cows, away from sheep and goats, um, keeping the herd isolated, um, and that really reduces that risk of disease transmission to our bison. Um, so we have a, what we consider a clean herd here, and we like to keep it that way. And that, I think, leads us uh, beautifully into Angela's question about uh, the genetic variety of our bison and, and how, how do you manage that? Yeah, so that uh, all goes into a, a big model um, to which we essentially evaluate our bison on, a, on an individual basis, whether their genetic contribution is, is something that, that we need to see here. So we really... Um, are working towards genetic diversity. And what happened is, is that, you know, when bison were decimated in the uh, late 1800s, there was only a few hundred bison left. And these bison were isolated in herds, um, some of the big national herds, Yellowstone National Bison Range, Teddy Roosevelt. Um, they were isolated, their genetics weren't allowed to mingle with other herds, and you had a bottlenecking effect from that. And so what we do here today is essentially the calves that are born here, we evaluate their uniqueness compared to the rest of the herd. So the calves that are the most unique are going to be ones that we want to keep. Um, and then we seek out um, through these national, these bigger national herds, genetics that we don't have represented within our herd. And we bring in uh, several young bulls uh, a couple to, uh, every couple of years uh, to naturally move up through the hierarchy system and become dominant bulls and hopefully get a chance to breed and introduce those genetics um, in a natural way. Uh, that being said, when we do bring new bulls in from, uh, from other places, uh, we have a quarantining process where they'll sit uh, for six weeks in their corral so we can observe them, make sure there's no uh, disease or anything that we need to be concerned about before we let them uh, uh, be introduced with the rest of the herd. Yeah, and I think this year we had well, in the last 12 months or so, we've had four, four new yeah. ones. We brought that came four in. from uh, Fort Niobrara. Mm -hmm. And then, and then how, we have a few from where, whereabouts? Rocky Mountain Arsenal. We have some from Rocky Mountain Arsenal. For those of you who don't know, that's right outside of Denver, in between Denver, the city, and the airport. Uh, we have some from Teddy Roosevelt, both the North and South herd. We have some from Cap Rock Canyon down in Texas. Um, we have some from Wind Cave National Park. I love that um, park. So we have bison from a lot of different places, um, and sometimes it's just a couple, and sometimes it's a lot from that area. So, um, and we know based upon all of our genetic testing, essentially what the composition of those ancient or those those original herds is for our bison, and that's what a lot of what we're doing our um, genetic testing and our modeling off of. Amazing. Thank you, Josh. I'm going to take a quick break. We have some more footage to show you. Uh, we're going to step away from bison for a little bit in our next segment to show you a little bit of our summer life here around the Crane Trust. So stay tuned. We will be showing that to you in a few minutes.
so around the trust this is something uh, that I do like to show people when we are talking about our habitat it is far more than just bison we always we look to, and cranes we uh, have a real holistic approach to our habitat here that when you help the cranes and the bison you help all the species and so that is something that uh, well, we do say here around the trust and without further ado I will show you uh, some of the things we've seen this summer while out uh, looking at and documenting bison. Uh, as many of you know, we sit on the Big Bend area of the Platte River, and this is uh, some footage of that river. And Josh, feel free to jump in uh, when you see fit as well. So the rivers run high, higher than uh, what, what we had last year, and what we're looking at right now is a red-winged blackbird. Uh, very uh, common to hear as well. These are dick sisals. Dick sisals, I think, are one of our priority species, right? Yeah, they're uh, dick sisals are a true grassland bird, um, and grassland. Uh, birds as as a whole are um, a threatened group really um, so there there's not a lot of grassland left especially tall grass prairie which is mostly agriculture now and so rather than being a species of concern it's really a flagship species that sort of speaks to the productivity and the uh, habitat value of our rest of our grassland birds so seeing dis dick thistles do well tells us that a lot of our other grassland birds are going to be doing well it's a red-headed blackbird, or red-headed uh, woodpecker. And then our, our upland sandpipers. So upland sandpipers are um, a species of concern in Nebraska. Um, they've had uh, really bad declines over the last 20, 30 years. Um, and it's really fun to see them because they are these uh, tall, gawky things on top of these posts, and they have uh, such a pretty twiddle of their uh, their call so when they're flying around it's just really fun to to hear these goofy birds um, that sort of look like a road runner from a distance so you kind of remind me of a crane piping plovers uh, we've had one successfully uh, have a chick this year and uh, we'll, we'll, we're going to see that chick here in a second uh, it's not great footage unfortunately it was very far away i captured this on a 12 it was a 600 millimeter lens with a two-time extender so very far out there on a uh, little island we have in a pond where we have had piping plovers uh, josh would you like to talk a little bit about piping plovers and their effort to preserve them yeah so uh, piping plovers uh, are an endangered species uh, endangered shorebird and uh, also, lease terns, which have been recently removed off the endangered species list, um, they need a very specific type of habitat for their nesting. And what they really like is open sandbars. Um, so that open sand uh, essentially gives them a place to hide their eggs because their eggs look identical to the sand to which they're laying their eggs in. Um, and we used to, along the plat, have many, many, many open sandbars before the channel has changed so much due to damming and other anthropic um, activity. Um, but as those sandbars are no longer exposed or available or no longer free of vegetation and open, um, we've had to kind of get creative about where we can provide nesting habitat for them. And what we found is they really um, are attracted to sand and gravel pits. So sand and gravel pits generally have water next to them and um, open and bare sand that they're mining out. And we can kind of recreate those habitats by um, essentially we built these big sand islands in the middle of this pond and we keep it uh, devegetated throughout the year. And um, as you can see, it, it definitely works for um, providing that supplemental um, habitat that they need for that nesting. And I clicked back on that so you could see a little bit what he was talking about. Now we're looking at regal fritillaries. This is a male, Josh. Um, I don't have very much footage of this, but that's on a, what is it? What kind of? Showy milkweed. Showy milkweed. I was going to say fancy. <laughs> But uh, they're also priority species. Yeah, so the regal fritillaries, um, and most people know the story of the monarch as being, you know, becoming an endangered species, needing, um, a, oddly enough, a milkweed for their larval, um, for their larval stage to feed on. And regal fritillaries um, 
unlike monarchs, are non-migratory. So they need um, they they need big uh, relic prairies that have never been tilled. Um, they spend their entire life cycle here, even the winter time that they spend in a sort of a stasis as a pupa, and. Again, unlike monarchs, um, regal fritillaries need violets um, for their larval for their larval stage. So they, mm. they graze and they eat violets as a caterpillar. And uh, a lot of the work that we do here is one, to provide those floral resources for these regal fritillaries, but then offer opportunities for them to expand throughout our property and, and develop new populations. That, and, that's not a violet. <laughs> no, no. And then, uh, these are just some pollinating plants. Uh, Josh is kind of the plant expert around here, but uh, I thought I'd share those as well. So the one you're seeing on your screen now is um, is black-eyed Susan, so um, the native variety of what a lot of people grow in their gardens. And that's our cottonwood trees. It's sunset. And... Uh, one of the things we're about to see are some fireflies. And are fireflies pollinators? Uh, no. So no? we don't really uh, consider they're not, them. They're not doing much for pollination, but um, they're a huge food resource um, for uh, bats and other things. So, um, But we have such an awesome showing of fireflies here in Nebraska, especially in, in central Nebraska, that sometimes they really just light up the sky. Thank you, Josh. Well, that's so informative. I think next time I'll make some of those clips longer so we have more uh, for you to talk about because you're so knowledgeable and I really appreciate all the knowledge you've brought uh, to tonight's program. Uh, we have a little bit more to show you. I think we're about 10 to 15 minutes out from close of program. And so if you have any last minute burning questions, please let us know. And we're going to look at some more bison footage. I think I'm going to show you some working bison footage from last last year uh, that Josh is prominently in and, and just we can talk a little bit about uh, our handling methods. So working bison is something we do in December. This year we had three goes because we had our uh, new group that came in, I should say last year. And then we had our visitor center herd, and then we had the main herd. So Josh, can you talk a little bit about the safe handling of our working bison? Well, I kind of hinted at it before. We practice low stress handling. So that's essentially the, the calmer we can keep our bison, um, the, the, the safer we are, the safer they are, and, and the better off and smoother this working process goes. So what we, why we work our bison, so we work them for several reasons. One is to get that genetic material off the new calves born for the year. Um, we do that by pulling a few tail hairs and sending that in for genetic analysis. Um, then we also uh, do a, a brief health check and make sure that their, their body, we do a body condition score to make sure that they're, they're filling out and they look healthy. Um, we also do a tagging system, so they are tagged with two tags. One's a USDA tag in case they're ever sold um, across state lines. And the other is a, um, a dangle tag, which is an identifier tag to which we use for all of our scientific study. Um, we use it for our stud books and making sure that we, um, you know, when we record an injury or possible sickness or something like that, we have something to reference back to. And as you'll see here, um, essentially what they're doing is moving through a funnel system um, with a series of sliding gates and that funnel system makes them feel like they're, they're escaping um, when they're actually getting closer to the, the squeeze chute that we use. Um, and we slide those gates behind them. Again, it's, it's really eerie and quiet when we're out here um, working our bison because we're trying to keep them and, and keep trying to keep our workers calm. Um, and again, the calmer we are, the smoother things go. Um, we've really been a testament to this low stress handling stuff because you know a few years ago when we first started this, it took us maybe 10 hours to work 60 bison and now we can work 160 in, in less than eight. 
Um, so it really is a testament to doing these low stress practices and, and how well they work. And then uh, we have a question from Jack and uh, how much how much do uh, bison generally weigh when they're I guess Jack is that for adults? So um, adults adult females will be somewhere between uh, about a thousand to twelve hundred pounds um, for a big female and the males will almost double so that a big male will be 22 2300 pounds on grass um, I've heard him go for as, as high as twenty six hundred dollars or twenty six hundred pounds on um, corn. So and when they're big and fat. So. And we have footage uh, from this past year's uh, working bison, which we will update and show you on Sunday for those of you who are joining our members program. If you've liked what you've seen tonight, uh, please consider becoming a Crane Trust member. Uh, it is a great benefit to us. It certainly helps us continue to do the work we do, but also importantly, you get the perk of having the advantage of seeing our live cameras and our virtual programs, our extended ones throughout the year, uh, as well as other perks like getting a first uh, opportunity to book crane tours and our top information. So if you're interested in becoming a Crane Trust member, I will put that link in the comments here in a second. Uh, we would greatly appreciate it. And we want to thank those of you who are members and those of you who have come to volunteer or even just support us throughout our time here at the Crane Trust. Thank you so much. And uh, we have one more clip to show you after this one. So if you have any last questions for Josh or myself or anything, Bison it can even be virtual. That's Patty, by the way. Um, I just wanted to give a shout out to Patty, one of our bison. Uh, if you have any questions for us, please let us know, and we would uh, love to answer them for you. All right, thank you so much. We are going to switch now to our final clip, bison. And there are fireworks in this one at the very end. So wait for that. Uh, Josh, do you have any last um, thoughts or comments? Um, I think one thing that a lot of people don't think about is, is the value of the rancher. Um, and, and, and bringing bison back to the landscape. Um, it's really the, the people that are, are changing their mind about bison and, and wanting to, to see them out there and wanting to get into the bison business is really the quickest way to see more bison on the landscape. Um, so as more people become interested in things like bison meat um, and that they put bison back on the land, they wind up being um, better stewards of the land. They wind up caring more about soil health and regenerative uh, grazing and things like that. And it, it's really just a great way to get um, ranchers and, and the community at large involved in, in, in ecosystem health and, and habitat protection. And without these, these ranchers that are out there doing it, we, we wouldn't have grasslands today. And, and really, we probably wouldn't have bison either. So. Um, kudos to those of you out there that are that are whether you're a cattleman or a bison rancher kudos to you for um, being stewards of the land thank you Josh and and I 
I love bison myself, and I've always been somewhat fascinated with them. I think even before I learned about cranes, I was, as a child, I was always very fascinated with, with these beautiful animals. So it is very exciting to have my favorite mammal and my favorite bird here in one place. Uh, and I don't know if any of you have any anecdotes about bison and or cranes you want to drop in the comments. We love looking at those. Uh, I think it's so interesting how people relate to animals and our beautiful spaces and habitats. And so we've got some cinnamons, that's what we call the little babies wandering around in some of this footage. What are the purple flowers, uh, Josh, that we're seeing? I'm seeing them all over the habitat right now. So uh, those purple flowers are, are blue vervain or hoary vervain. Um, they're in the verbena family. Uh, so many of you that if you garden or grow flowers, you'll know what a verbena is. Um, typically we see them in trailing, as a trailing vine in our, our potted plants. Um, but uh, these ones, these native verbenas, grow upright and they tend to flower um, the entire summer. So they one of the earlier flowering plants and then they continue to flower um, as long as we get rain and stuff. So they're, they're a great pollinator plant. They tend to um, show up in places that have had grazing disturbance in the past several years. So. These bison running through the shot is so adorable. They're just having fun out there. My favorite reptiles and fish. Oh, geez. Uh, <laughs> I will have to think on that one. Uh, I love all animals. Uh, I, I do like bull snakes. I don't think that's my favorite reptile, though. Fish? Oh, uh, geez. Do you have a favorite fish, Josh? Oh, well, the plains top minnow comes to mind. So that's a fish that occurs in our warm body sloughs. That's a, a state species of concern, especially with the amount we've changed waterways and how few prairie uh, creeks and streams we, we still have left. Um, the plains top minnow is just a, a great spokes fish for um, for our, our slough areas. I'll have to look that one up. I can think of a number of fi I love sharks. They're cool. fish. Uh, having been in Australia, there's there's a lot of fish that I've loved. So I, I think I can't narrow that one down tonight. I'll have to think on that. Thank you, though, for the question. Um, Angela, South Dakota. And yes, Sandhill Cranes in Texas. Now, Angela, you might be aware that Aransas is where uh, whooping cranes go in the in the winter. Uh, Josh, do you know a little bit about that? Yeah, so whooping cranes, uh, whooping cranes tend to go down to one place in, in Texas called Aransas Wildlife Refuge. And the, and the reason they're going there is mainly because it's, it's a source for inland water blue crab. Um, so they can be close to the coast, close to still grasslands down there, and um, feed on those blue crab all throughout the winter, gaining uh, their energy needs to start migrating back north. Uh, Sandhill cranes, though, are distributed throughout the south in Texas, um, New Mexico, places like that, that um, uh, once they get through the migratory corridor heading south, they really start to fan out. Um, so you may see some big congregations down in Texas for sure. Yeah hoping that maybe I'll get down there here soon to to see some of that action myself. I'm also very interested in the Mississippi Sandhill Crane. <clears throat> now that one I believe um, is that population's kind of critically endangered at the moment. So uh, if you are in other parts of the country and you're visiting Nebraska in the spring, bear in mind that uh, you can also see cranes at other times of the year and many of those cranes do come here in the spring, so I think that connection is really fascinating.
Yeah, and it is to me uh, fascinating, Angela, how some of these bison are just so magnificently large, especially the bulls. And they just stand out there in the middle of the pasture and they're just this huge, beautiful bison. And then sometimes I'm surprised at how petite some of the bison are, especially the yearlings. I'm like, yeah, so that uh, petiteness isn't necessarily a, a sign of, of worse condition. Um, what they're finding is, is that uh, bison, just like humans, exist, existed in all sorts of shapes and sizes, um, each of them having their own um, evolutionary um, positives and negatives. Um, but you, what you notice is that you know bison can graze from tall grass prairie to short grass steppe to intermountain grasslands all the way to sandy desert type areas um, and uh, it's not an ecological advantage to be a big heavy fat bison in an area that's arid what you'd want to do is be able to consume resources that are that in the most efficient way and sometimes that means not packing on the pounds so again, seeing a skinny bison doesn't necessarily mean you're seeing an unhealthy bison. And um, how long does it take a bison to become full size? Uh, females are usually ready to breed by somewhere between two and a half to three years. We start to see um, them being ready to breed. And then bulls uh, sort of plateau for a little while, about that three years. And then by about five, they really start to gain a lot of weight and body mass. Um, and then they sort of hit that breeding, prime breeding age, somewhere between uh, five and nine years old. Okay, so, and we have a lot of yearlings. Uh, Patty, who we mentioned, was uh, one of our bison. She she has an interesting story. If you're interested in that, please do join us on Sunday. But uh, she's grown quite a bit in the last year. Yeah. So it is fun to to kind of see how they change over time too. And so here we are, bison and fireflies. And as, as this footage uh, comes to a close, I will bring our river camera footage up again. So we are down to the last few minutes of our show. If you have any questions, comments, curiosities, feel free to drop them in the comments section. I want to thank Josh again for being here tonight. Josh, do you have a final words here in the last few minutes? No, I don't think so. It's really neat seeing those fireworks in the distance. I'm assuming that's Donovan's fireworks going off there. Or yes. Potentially. Uh, Not ours. <laughs> yeah, potentially <laughs> the uh, the housing development around the lakes down the way. So mm -hmm. This is taken on the 3rd of July, I believe. It's really close to the 4th. So Over the long weekend. And the bison, uh, well, luckily we were far away enough from the fireworks. There wasn't any kind of auditory issue but the bison were pretty calm through all this which as you can see they're just out there living their best lives in the fireflies and fireworks So thanks again, Josh, for joining us. And at this time, I want to thank you all for being here uh, for tonight's mini session and our guided virtual bison tour. Uh, we are going to collect more footage for Sunday, but uh, if you do wanna join us, please do check out that Crane Trust link and think about becoming a member. If you are a member uh, or a supporter of any type of the Crane Trust, we want to pay a special thanks uh, for your support because we certainly appreciate it and rely on it uh, to continue to protect and maintain the physical, hydrological, and biological integrity of the Big Bend area of the Platte River. Uh, as we've seen, it's a vital uh, life support function for so many species. Um, Whooping cranes, sandhill cranes, bob whites, upland sandpipers. You want to throw a few out, Josh? Maybe some grass ones that nobody's heard of. Um, bobolinks, um, 
we have uh, we see our bison um, provide habitat for our lizards, like our uh, uh, speedicellas, our uh, racers. Um, we also see bison providing habitats for really small things, so, so um, like our small mammals, um, like our voles and our meadow jumping mice. Um, we also see ants and lots of insects using bison wallows. Um, and then most recently, uh, after almost uh, 25 to 30 years without seeing one, uh, we have prairie dogs. And um, those prairie dogs just happen to be showing up where um, bison are. What about vegetation? Uh, species of plants? So uh, a couple species only occur in bison wallows. So we have a really, really uh, short, low-growing, um, kind of a ground cover plant called malugo um, <coughs> that most people probably have never seen or probably have seen and looked right over. Um, bison also have uh, uh, inspired the growth of a grass called purple top. Um, and we start to see that more and more in the, our bison areas. Thank you, Josh. Moving the camera around for you just so you can see. And that is the tip of Mormon Island. And so this is the full spectrum of our river. And I'm going to leave you with this closing shot and also remind you that one of the uh, life support system, this area provides a life support system for our great American bison. And I want to invite you to join us for our next guided virtual bison tour Sunday at 7 p.m. It is members exclusive, so we hope you join us. And once again, thank you so much for being here tonight. Uh, feel free to leave any questions to virtual at cranetrust.org. And this is Kylie and Josh signing off. Thanks, everyone. Have a great evening.